I heard that door to that little building slam into the side of the building and something went running out of there. It sounded like a herd of woolly mammoths. I heard a pause when it leaped over the fence. It went right down over the hill, down into where the spring to the west is, and then I could hear it running all the way down into the swamp. I mean, you couldn't have made this sound. I, can't, I tried to make sounds like it. I experimented for days while I was here trying to make something sound like this. Even big logs that I would stand up on their end and then drop over did not make the sound this thing made running. I couldn't slap the ground with an iron pan and make it sound like this sounded. And you could feel it. I'm 40 or 50 feet away from where this thing came out of the building. And you could feel those first steps it took. I can drop a log from 10 feet in the air and it won't make the sound or make the ground shake like this thing did. I know that you haven't had, as you put it, a Bigfoot crossing the road in front of you uh, right. type encounter, but what are some of the things that you have experienced? Well, my first experiences really have uh, the ones that I know for a fact were some kind of that weren't just normal experiences that all occurred in adulthood. Um, in childhood, I was scared to death. I knew about Bigfoot. I knew, I knew it was a real thing, you know, in the way that children know something. Um, and I was scared to death of it. I can't, I, to this day, my bedroom doesn't have any windows in it. I will not sleep in a room with windows. Um, my big, my windows had to be covered in sheets and blankets for me to sleep. I was terrified something was going to look in the window. There were times as a child that there were shadows crossed the window and my bedroom was on the end of our house, which was eight feet off the ground. Mm -hmm. So stuff was going on and I just didn't really, I didn't want to believe what it was. I wanted to think Bigfoot was a phenomenon in the Pacific Northwest and that couldn't happen here. Little did I know I was growing up in, in Bigfoot Central. But, you know, we always had the stories, too. And even as a child, and part of what drove me into science was I wanted to prove um, my ancestors wrong with some of what I considered their superstitions. You know, I wanted to I wanted to find out what the truth was, you know, rather than just accepting their fairy folk tales as truth. But they were always telling about the boogeyman and don't go out at night, you know, you know all the all the stuff. Right. And um, so I wanted not to believe it. And yet was scared to death of it. Uh, but I never had an experience as a child. I was all over the woods, but I always felt watched and I always felt protected. I always felt like I could go anywhere. The closest thing I have to there possibly being one occur in childhood, I was in the woods behind my grandparents' house, like two hills over, so good ways from the house, and a neighbor's dogs come rushing through barking at us and trying to a attack me and my brother. And I'm, I'm eight or nine years old. So I take off running and something stopped those dogs. I didn't turn around to look, but all of a sudden the dogs were not chasing us. And you could hear the dogs yelping and screaming and running away. That's the closest thing in childhood that possibly happened. Now, in childhood, I remember hearing the story about the Bigfoot walking down the creek here that runs in front of my house. And we would go sleigh riding on the hills here that run down to that creek where my house sits now. And I was always scared to death I was going to see Bigfoot down in these woods. These woods that I live above always have felt weird and creepy and haunted. And, you know, they just have that vibe about them. They're right on a swampy area. And um, there's a spring to the southeast of my house. And there's a spring to the west of my house. And... Um, so I was always terrified sleigh riding that there was going to be a Bigfoot in the edge of the woods or come out of the woods. I mean, and where does stuff like that even come from? You know, because I mean, certainly <laughs> yeah. I was watching, I was watching the shows, you know, I was watching In Search Of and anything I could get, you know, that I could watch. And once I was in my teens and I, I was finding books on them, I was reading things, you know, I read uh, 
Sanders and, you know, anything I could get a hold of early on. Um, but it was only as an adult that I've had real experiences. Um, one experience that happened, and I don't know what this actually was. This was in 1994. It was the month I had moved back up here from Florida to the house. I was out back with a friend who had helped me move um, up here. He stayed for about a month, so I kind of know the time frame. We were standing out back, and um, at the front of my house, there's a, a, a bank that drops down about five feet, and there was a little tree there right beside the deck. And all of a sudden, we see something step up that bank in one step. It was stepped from down below the bank right up beside that tree. It was standing there looking at us, but it was invisible. It looked like the Predator from the movie Predator. Huh. It looked like glowing, fizzing, yellow waves of heat on pavement that had like little, like almost like little rainbow sparks in it if you were seeing it out of the corner of your eye. But if you looked dead on it, you couldn't see anything. And it was right after I'd moved back. Um, I just took it, here again, falling back on my raisin, um, I just took it that it was the, the, the spirit of the spring down below the house. You know, because that, that one spring, the one to the south of my house, the southeast, is, is active and creepy. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, well, that's, that's the water spirit, you know, because water spirits are a big thing in the, in the fey lore. And um, I was not quite at the point where I was questioning that fey lore as deeply. And so I was like, eh, water spirit. And so we stood there for a minute or so, and it just stood there. It didn't do anything. It looked very lift, very thin, tall and thin. This thing would have been tall, nine feet, um, and very, very thin. The arms were long, but the whole thing was just thin. And um, But you couldn't make any details because you couldn't see anything. How far away were you? Oh, 45 feet. My house is 36 feet long. We were standing about two feet away from the back of the house, and it was standing about eight or 10 feet from the, from the front of the house. So 40, 45, 50 feet tops. Could you notice, was it physically uh, impacting the environment, like the vegetation yeah, around it? Yes, you could see the tree move. That's what we first noticed. Okay. When it stepped up on that bank, the tree, the bottom ban- branches moved. Yeah, and it and I remember distinctly it had its arm. It had to have had its arm because it had to have reached up into that tree when it came up. I think that's what caused the tree to move. Hmm. But that's what we noticed first, and we both glanced at the same time. And I said to my friend, "Do you see that?" He said, "Yeah, let's go in the house." And I said, "No, wait just a second. I just kind of stand there and stood there and looked at it. And again, this will sound totally woo and crazy, and I hate saying things like this, but I flashed good energy at it. I made my energy body yellow." which to it was, you know, in, in my way of thinking and my experience is like happy, um, welcoming color, you know, I mean, cause I, I hate this. <laughs> I see auras and when I see someone with a yellow aura, they're generally very jovial, happy people. And so it was like, it was like saying welcome. Yeah. I flashed that energy at it, but it was also a way of saying to it, I see you, and I can make this energy change colors if I need to. And uh, it didn't do anything. It just stood there. I felt like it was a greeting. It didn't feel aggressive. There was no sound. There was, you know, the background sounds continued. Uh, You know, you could still hear the birds. This didn't do anything, you know, like the typical scary kind of encounter. But then again, I am not even though I was a complete coward of everything as a child, as I grew up and got older, I lost you know, a lot of that fear. And I, I, I just didn't have a fear response to this. Mm-hmm. There was no fear involved in this. And I have to say another little dirt road. I think a lot of times that whole fear thing that people are feeling is their own stuff and not necessarily what the beings are doing. It's an ancestral reaction. You know, it's a, it's a subconscious reaction. I'm not in every instance because I've been hit with something that made me fearful, <laughs> but, um, this was not doing any of that. This felt like a greeting, like welcome back, or a welcoming of some kind. And I regret, honestly, that my reaction was as 
standoffish to it as it was. I wish I'd stayed outside longer and, and seen what it was going to do. But we went in the house because my friend was freaking out. And I was like, well, I told you. You know, and he had seen uh, a, a, an orb become a craft with me just a couple weeks before. And so he was just, you know, he he, he had to go back to Florida. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean. Um, I did have a thing happen in Florida when I lived in Gainesville, Florida. Of course, there's all kinds of Bigfoot reports from there. Um, I had gone out um, on the main drag that goes out past Payne's Prairie. There's a place out there. I used to go and park way out in the country and walk down this uh forest road, like a logging road, or I think it was like a, Kentucky would be like forestry service. I'm not sure what it is down in Florida. Um, But I would go down there and walk often by myself, just way out in the woods down this trail. And I always felt great out there, loved it. And one time I was out there and just suddenly knew I had to turn around and leave. And it wasn't that I didn't go into a panic. I didn't go into fear. It was just an absolute knowing at that moment, I best get the hell out of here. I turned around and left and nothing happened. And so, you know, so I know that fear can hit people. You know, I'm not saying that it can't, but um, I think a lot of times that fear response is something that's within the person. It's their response rather than the object itself. Because I was have I would have fear responses at times to these orbs. You know, one night I would go out and they'd do their little dance and I'd be completely fine. The next night I'd go out and they would do the exact same thing and I'd get scared and have to go in the house. Huh. And that's, that's, I, I think that was me. I don't think it was them. I don't think they were doing anything different. So then later of things that happen that are big ish in nature. Um, at one point in the year 2001, I, um, Moved for a year to go to one of the big cities here in the state I live in uh, to, as part of my research project, um, the actual hands-on growing the animals part had ended. And so I went back up to one of the universities just for collating data and some stuff like that that I was working on. And so I was living in a city at that time and wasn't living here in the house. And in April of 2002, I came back down here. And for whatever reason, in 2000, I had found the BFRO website, and then I found the GCBRO, and then I found Blog Talk Radio and all that, so I'd gone crazy. <laughs> you followed the same path I did. <laughs> yeah, I'd gone, I'd gone Bigfoot crazy. I, was, I didn't do anything but read and listen to Bigfoot stuff. I came back here that April. One day, of course, the animals weren't here, and I have a big animal building uh, uh, to the west of my house. And of course, my house property is on a hillside. And so the house and this animal house, uh, the long side runs east to west and the front and back run north to south. And so if you're at my house, you walk out of my house to the west and then you turn and go just up the, the bank, you know, five or 10 feet. And then you turn to the west again to go into the area where these where the animals were. And there were no animals there, and I had left some of the doors open, not thinking anything of it. You know, we had cleared out. That part of the program was over, and so the animals had gone on to, you know, to the for, for study. They had gone on to – they had been shipped out. They weren't here. And so the buildings were sitting empty. And I was I don't even know what I was doing going up there that day. I guess I was just checking on it or probably walking out to look at garden plants or something. And – um, I had built a little building on the side of that building, a little room, like an eight by six. And then I had built another room on the front of that building that was like an eight by 21. And so as you're approaching the building, you can't see that little eight by six building on the back end. So I get to the point where I would turn and go up the little bank. And all of a sudden, I heard that door to that little building slam into the side of the building, and something went running out of there that sounded like a herd of woolly mammoths and went running to the west. I heard a pause when it leaped over the fence. It went right down over the hill, down into where the spring to the west is, and then I could hear it running all the way down into the swamp. And every step it took sounded like you had 
well, I don't know what. It sounded like, I mean, you couldn't have made this sound. I, I tried to make sounds like it. I experimented for days while I was here trying to make something sound like this. And even big logs that I would stand up on their end and then drop over did not make the sound this thing made running. And that that had to have been something of this nature. I mean, that, you know, I mean, I didn't see it. Just force of it hitting the ground? Yeah, yeah, it's feet. It sounded like feet the size of a, a feet, like four foot by four foot slap in the ground. You know, I mean, they weren't that big, obviously, but, right. you know, I sound like this, this. I couldn't slap the ground with an iron pan and make it sound like this sounded. And you could feel it. You know, I'm 40 or 50 feet away from where this thing came out of the building. And you could feel those first steps it took. I mean, I, I can drop a log from 10 feet in the air and it won't make the sound or make the ground shake like this thing did. Yeah, I've talked to several people that talk about feeling it as they run off or whatever. Yeah. And that, that, yeah. that takes like a tremendous, I mean, like things like elephants yeah. come to mind or, you know, cattle stampeding and things like that. Uh, but you want to know what's really screwed about all that? Not a footprint. Nothing. Nothing. But I'll tell you what it did leave. You could see the path in the field because when it jumped over the fence, it went out of my garden area jumped over the fence into a field, which at that time was basically just grass and weeds, and then on down into the woods. You could see the path that it took. It just didn't leave any footprints. You know, you could see that the vegetation was had been parted. What was in the building? Anything? Nothing. Nothing. It was standing there empty. I, I think it had been in there sheltering. If that makes any sense, it doesn't make any sense to me, but that's kind of what I think. It was like, it, you know, it had found this building with an open door. I was like, hey, I'm going to spend the night here, you know? I mean, that doesn't really sound crazy at all to me. <laughs> I mean, I, there's been so many circumstances where uh, people had them taking shelter in barns and sheds and garages well, and everything exactly. else. So it's an old barn standing empty right up the hill. Um, and I've never seen one in that barn. The, the barn's not there now. We tore it down a few years ago because it you know, fell apart. It was an old, old barn. But that barn always gave me the creeps. And, of course, that barn is right in the middle of the spring at my uncle's house that I saw the orb that turned into a UFO come out of and the spring this thing ran down to. <laughs> the barn set right in the middle of it on a, on a high point. Uh. <laughs> and um, not that that necessarily means anything, but it's interesting. Yeah. But this thing ran down to that spring and then I heard it go on it because that spring makes a little creek that feeds down into the creek that runs in front of my house and there's a swampy area down there. And I rarely go down into those woods. I have huge bamboo groves around the house too. And um, I, I don't go down in the woods much. It's not that I'm scared to. It's just that it's like, well, you know, you all stay down there and I'll stay up here. Yeah. Right. It seems to work for us all. Um, so that was one. Um, then another year, I moved back for several years and, and continued with a slightly different project. And then when that one was over, I repeated the same pattern. Um, I left here for a year and, and went up to the city and was there for about a year. And again, in April um, of that year, that would have been 2009, I came back down here and I had been having dreams about one of my types of bamboo. I have this rare type of bamboo that was planted down up above that spring to the southeast, and I kept dreaming about it. And I thought, that's weird. And so when I got here, what had happened is some of the local crackhead kids had, um, I, I mean kids, I mean teenagers or young adults, some of our local meth heads had, um, while I was gone, had come down into those uh, woods and were camping out and they had cut some of that bamboo and it's a real slow growing type that's hard to establish and of course them cutting it set it back severely and so of course I called the local police and they came out and did their investigation and uh, you know neighbors saw who did it and so I told them who did it and they talked to them and this was so funny when the officer came back and told me it was so hard not to laugh he said well, now them kids told me that you ran them off, that you were up there screaming and throwing stuff at them and ran them out. I said, I don't live here right now. <laughs> <laughs> so 
something had run them off. And uh, of course they were right above that spring. I wouldn't camp above that spring, but anyhow they had. So while I was here, um, one of the nights while I was staying here, and I don't remember exactly when it was, I was asleep here. I sleep in the upstairs. My house is a earth shelter with a high pitched roof and I've got a bedroom upstairs. And like I said, no windows in the bedroom. Um, and there's a back door though, that goes out the back. And when you come in the back door, I built a false wall that's about four feet from the back door. And my bed is against that false wall. So my bed is about four feet from the back door. So I'm laying there asleep. It's about three in the morning. All of a sudden I wake up and there are people out back talking. I thought, well, those damn kids are back. They're messed up and they're out here behind my house. And so I laid there thinking I'm going to have to get up and get a shotgun, run them off. And I started listening. And it, it was, uh, it was the, um, wasn't the samurai chatter, but it, it was not an intelligible human language. Hmm. Two things talking right behind. I mean, they, they couldn't have been more than eight feet away. And then when I came really, I'm really alert and I'm really listening. All of a sudden they hit the wall above the door. Well, that's 10 feet above the door. Something smacked the wall, but it didn't feel threatening. I didn't feel scared. I laid back down, went right to sleep. And, um, I think they were letting me know we're watching, we're watching the place for you. And there was nothing else. Nothing else happened. That was it. <laughs> I was going to ask you if anything had ever slapped the wall at your house. Oh, that's their favorite. Yeah. I love that one. Um, most activity here happens in the spring or the fall. We typically don't get a lot of summer or winter activity. Although I had some activity this summer, which was really unusual. But, um, that happened in the spring. Both of those instances that I just told you both happened in April. And um, so those were spring encounters. Um, and yeah, they also flipped the wall. I was on the phone one night with a friend and, you know, my um, house uh, is an earth shelter. So it's got that high pitched roof and the sides of my roof go all the way down to the ground on the sides, mm -hmm. you know, and then the back has a, some wall out of the ground and then the front has both stories out of the ground. Right. Um, I've heard things run across the roof. I had something run across the roof one night around 2004, 2005 that shook the whole roof. The light fixtures were shaking and I thought, well, they, they've just torn my roof off. And, um, but nothing. I was on the phone one night with a friend, not too many years ago, three or four years ago. And one of them just, I mean, it sounded like an elephant had thrown itself into the east side of the roof. To the point that my friend was like, did you just fall down the stairs? <laughs> and I said, uh, no, that was, that was the good folk. They're, they're wanting me to know they're out there. And they didn't do anything else. But yeah, they, they do that kind of stuff. They don't do it regularly. They don't do it often, but they do it. And I'll just tell you one of the things I do that keeps them away from the back. I piss outside the back door every day. Really? Yeah, just to tell them, you know, this is mine. Yeah. You just stay off my back door. And um, they do. I, I, I find them, whatever I'm interacting with, very considerate. <laughs> um, they have never forced me to see them. I know as a young person, if I'd seen them, I'd have lost my mind. I'd have been hospitalized. If as an adult I'd seen them, I don't know what my reaction would be. I think I'm at the point where if I saw one, I would probably shrug and go on about my work. Um but I think it's taken me a long time to get there, and I think they have been extraordinarily considerate. But I'll tell you what I do where, where they're concerned, because it's, it's the same thing my ancestors would have done with, with the Fey folk. Um, I, don't, I don't really gift. Um, you know, I don't do that kind of stuff, but I do throw things out. You know, um, if an animal died, I'd throw it out, you know. So, um, you know, I, I have fed them once or twice, I assume, uh, but I just go out and talk to them just like I'd talk to anybody else. What do you say? Well, just like, it depends on the situation. If, you know, like if they're, sla if they get to slapping on the house a lot, I'm like, you know, that scares me. You know, that bothers me. I know it's cute. I know y'all are getting a kick out of it. Please stop. And it'll quit for a time. 
So, you know, they seem to be considerate. Now, other things I've had happen, I was out one evening in late November, um, way after dark, probably like 1130 at night, putting Christmas lights on a Japanese maple that was beside the house. And up in the bamboo grove to the northeast, um, something did like a tree knock on the bamboo that was five knocks in a row, real hard and real loud. Boom, 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 boom. I just said, okay, I I know y'all don't want me out here right now, but I've got to get the rest of these lights strung, and then I'll go in the house if y'all can possibly stand it until I can get this finished. I'm almost done. And so nothing else happened. Then one time, um, back early when I had first moved back from Florida in 94, um, a friend was staying with me, and the woods down in front of the house, I had gotten the wild hair that I was going to go down and clear some pathways to make it kind of more park-like. And so we were down there working and clearing, and I, we weren't cutting big trees or anything. We were basically cutting underbrush. And um, all of a sudden, me and him both got sick. We couldn't stand up and had to basically help each other out of the woods. And both were sick and threw up and had a raging headache the whole day and that night and the next day. And, you know, we're sick. And, um, you know, again, I just shrugged. And I was like, well, we got too close to the, to the spring. The water spirit didn't want us there because water spirits will do malicious stuff. Water spirits don't like humans as a general rule, and they'll zap you. Um, now what that means in scientific terms, I have no idea, but that fits with the mythology and it fits with my personal experience. You know, anywhere I've ever been around and sensed what I call or my ancestors called water spirits, they're hostile. Now, if you just talk to them and explain what you're doing, they will become neutral sometimes, but I have never met one of them that was like excited or happy. (laughs) (laughs) So anyhow, I just shrugged and was like, well, the water spirit doesn't want us down there doing it. And so we quit. We didn't do any more on it. We left it alone. Nothing else happened. Um, So now I don't know what it was. Another instance happened in like 2010 or 11. Um, I got up and went with my mom to the grocery stores fairly early in the day. And I'll I'll say I'm fairly nocturnal. Um, I tend to get up about two or three in the evening, and I like to go to bed sometime between four and noon. I always have been. School was torture because it was not on my algorithms. And um, so anyhow, I'd gotten up early to go to the store with my mother. She wanted some help. She was, you know, needing to pick up some things at Lowe's. And so I said, yeah, I'll go with you. And when I went outside, again, this isn't spring, there was this smell in the air that was like, vetiver and roses and rich earth. It was the most beautiful smell. And I was like, oh, the smells of spring. Isn't that beautiful? So I get in the car and I leave and I come back. I've got my groceries and I'm unload my groceries. And all of a sudden at the car, um, I got weak and just about passed out and had to sit down. I had to eat an apple and I knew what was happening, I, or at least I guessed, you know, I made a assumption of what was happening. I, I was pretty sure I was being hit by infrasound or ultrasound or something. I was being hit by energy wave of some kind because that just doesn't happen. I, I, I don't get like a low blood, blood sugar fits or things like that, you know. Um, and it was really weird. I had to eat an apple. I had these Granny Smith apples I had gotten. So I ate one and I sort of came back too. And the message then that I got was, we want one of those. And so I threw it up in the bamboo and took the rest of the groceries in the house. And that was an example of mind speak. I've rarely had mind speak happen in day-to-day life, but I've had dreams with them. And I, and I hate talking about dream stuff worse than anything because, Lord, who knows? I don't know what those are. But I've certainly had a lot of stuff happen in dreams. Now, um, there's someone I know who lives around here that the um, woods – on the uh, northwestern side of our of the family farm abutted a big, huge section of woods. And when I was a kid, you could go back into those woods, and they were all grown up. 
so that you it had been a field that had been allowed to grow up. So you had trees that had grown up to the overhead level and all the briars and underbrush under the trees had like died out. And so it was like it was full of tunnels. Mm-hmm. And honestly, it looked cleared. And I don't think it was natural. I've never seen anything like this. And years later, a friend told me that when he was a kid, him and one of the neighbors who were friends would go in there and play, and that there were cat people that lived in there. Cat people. Cat people. Now, this is what he was calling them. Now, this this poor guy, he worked for me for a while. Not real bright, not real well-educated, but he said that their faces were flat, because I, I made him describe every detail of this. He said their faces were flat, and that they had like little sharp teeth that came out of their mouth, and that's why they called them cat people. Huh. And that they would go in there, and they would play hide-and-seek with them. Were they just like uh, normal human size? Oh, no. No, they were big. They were black. Huh. Yeah, and, and they were scared of them, but they used to go in and play with them. And the whole reason that he even told me that story was because when I went to pick him up one day to do some work, um, you know, he was mucking out animal stalls and stuff. I went and picked him up and I came back a back road that was different from the path I usually took. I came up the back hill to get here. And he said, oh, my friend lived over there. I've been over there a lot. And I was like, yeah, well, our, our farm ends over there. We used to play back in those backwoods. And so he started telling me this story, just completely volunteered it out of nowhere. And, um, and when he described and what he described was a, was a Bigfoot, yeah. you know, big, hairy, human looking thing with these flattened in faces that, you know, they would smile and they had these little sharp teeth. That's interesting. So, yeah. So there's another one. Then another incident on this same little creek that runs in front of my house. If you go up that back road and you go around, there's a road then that runs all the way around through there and goes down the creek. And all of my cousins live over there. You know, so this uh, this whole area is my extended family. And so one of my cousins built this beautiful little A-frame house over there, and the whole front's glass. And at that time, there's not that many people live on that road, and it faces right on right at the creek. It's across the road from the creek, but it faces right at the creek. So he got married and moved his wife in there, and they're young people. They're in their 20s or whatever at the time. And um, – the next thing you know, she's had a nervous breakdown and had to be hospitalized. And the story was that while he was gone to work at night, he worked third shift, the devil would come and look in the windows at her. Oh, wow. And of course, that's the Pentecostal side of the family, so everything was the devil. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, but yeah, that was the story. Devil came and looked in the windows at her every night with red glowing eyes, and would, and uh, she, she lost it. She was hospitalized for years. Wow. Yeah. And that's, but it never was, did, and of course my question was, well, was it doing anything? It never did anything, just stood there and watched, you know? And that's the reason that I, that's one of the reasons that I kind of think your worldview and how tightly you're clinging to a worldview, whether it's religious or materialist or whatever it is, if something shakes up your worldview, that can send you into real terror and trauma. Oh, for sure, for sure. And that's one of the reasons that I think a lot of these fear reactions maybe have more to do with the person having the fear than the actual being itself. Not in every instance, but in some. Um, But then again, you know, I have a lack of firsthand experience because none of my experiences have been these aggressive type experiences. You know, I've never had anything like that. And because I was already primed to know that there are things out there other than humans, it didn't shake my worldview. Right. Created kind of a buffer. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's kind of like a patch. I didn't get the computer virus. So, or it didn't make my operating system go offline. (laughs) (laughs) But um, let's see, then another instance, again, this happened right above that spring that's to the west of my house. Um, I was over there. Um, I have some gardens up behind the house up the hill that are directly up from that spring. And for, you know, occasionally I'll walk through the woods, but for some reason that day I got a wild hare to walk down through those woods. Sometimes I do it just to see if there's anything down there. Sometimes I'm just like, I'm going to walk down through here and see if I can see me a footprint or if someone's going to pop out from behind a tree. Nothing ever does. But what I did find that day, um, laying on the path, the animal path, the deer path, up above the spring um, was a dead deer. 
And I thought, well, poacher's been in here hunting because I, I, you know, I don't hunt. I don't have anything against hunting. I just don't have time for it. And I raise more food than I can eat anyhow, so I don't need to hunt. Although the deer are constantly in my gardens, and I tell the Bigfoot all the time, eat every deer you can get your hands on. <laughs> Help yourself. Wipe them out. Yeah. Deer uh, as an endangered species is my fantasy. I, not seriously, but jokingly but um so anyhow there was this deer down there at first i thought poachers i thought well i'm i need to go up and call the cops and i thought i just for some reason i thought you need to look at this both front legs are broken and twisted the head is broken backwards and twisted there's no bullet holes anywhere and uh, the stomach is split open and all the entrails are missing huh I, i've heard that story before <laughs> yeah yeah and they hadn't taken any of the meat what poacher kills a deer and doesn't take the meat yeah, I mean, a poacher at the very least is, you know, going to cut off the hindquarters and things like that, get the yeah, back strap. exactly. Exactly. And nothing was missing. None of the muscle had been taken. What had been taken were the internal organs and the guts. And that was all that was missing. And there were no bullet holes. Because let me tell you, I went over that thing with a fine-tooth comb once I realized what I was looking at. Was there any blood? No, not a drop. That's the one that always gets me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. And that's another thing. If if a poacher had shot it, there'd have been a blood trail. Yeah. I mean, I, I've I've been hunting before. I you know I'm a good shot. Um, and certainly I know how to track a blood trail. I know I can handle myself in the woods. I know how to track, uh, you know, trails. I know how to track footprints. I mean, I spent the first twenty years of my life basically in the woods. So I, I, I know what I'm looking at, and no blood trails, no blood, no internal organs, no bullet holes. Did the uh, stomach look cut open? That's the thing. It looked like you'd taken a scalpel. It wasn't ripped. It wasn't torn. It was cut. Of course, though, you know, my thought was, I bet you money a Bigfoot with a big, tough, thick fingernail could do that. Yeah. So that wouldn't necessarily, I mean, I don't think it was a deer mutilation from a UFO, (laughs) you know, I think that was probably related to this, to the other phenomena, whatever, I don't even know what to say to to Bigfoot-ish things. Um, Another of my favorite stories that happened, my brother's house is right across the road, up just slightly north from mine on the same family farm, and um, his wife, of course, doesn't believe in any of this stuff, and... um, uh, so one day she was out on the porch of their house and uh, quote unquote, a bear went walking through the woods. And when it saw her see it, it got behind a tree and kept peeking out behind the tree at her. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And at first she, at first she said it was a Bigfoot. And then later she changed the story to it's a bear. And she always tells it it's a bear. Now she gets mad when we say it was a Bigfoot because me and my brother both are like, well, it was a Bigfoot. And, um, it was gray. And I was like, well, um, how many gray bears have you ever seen in our area? There aren't really any bears in our area. There are a few black bears coming back through that pass through, but there are none that live here. But yeah, I was walking on his hind legs, just walking through. And then it, when it saw her see it, it got behind the tree and started peeking out at her. And now her excuse is that she didn't have her glasses on and she can't see well at a distance. So she doesn't know what she saw. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like just the stereotypical non-believer sighting trying to rationalize what they saw. Trying to rationalize it. Yeah, exactly. Well, and she's down there by herself during the day. I'm sure she, it scares her. And, you know, I understand. Yeah. I mean, in that situation, I would probably try to convince myself I saw a, a, a gray bear peeking at me from behind the tree, too. Absolutely. Well, you know, I have tried over the years to convince myself of everything under the sun with everything I've ever experienced that wasn't scientifically explainable under current scientific paradigms. And every time I fail and come up empty handed and I am too um, honest with myself to be able to continue that self-deception very long. I finally have to come around to, you know, you didn't see swamp gas. (laughs) (laughs) You know, you know that a bear didn't kill that deer. You know a poacher didn't kill that deer. So there's another one. Um, she saw that. Um, one time they were laying in the bed and something got up on their back deck, which is 15 feet off the ground, and went stomping across it and then jumped off the end of it, and they could hear it hit the ground. But they're convinced that was a bear. They have a real bear problem. Real bear problem. And those, those, those bipedal bear. 
Yeah. They're they're a plague in these here parts. <laughs> and then of course, you know, interspersed through all this is things running across the roof and things hitting on the back of the house here and there and but then I don't ever see footprints. I've never seen footprints. Um, I've never, even when that thing hit the side of the house so hard that my friend on the phone with me heard it and thought I'd fallen down the stairs, um, no footprints, no mark on the, on the house. There should, there should have been like, I mean, even if it was just a deer fell into the house, there should have been the, the roof was dirty. It was dusty. There should have been a mark where the fur rubbed against it. Nothing. Yeah. You know? And that's the thing that leads me to believe that this is all just a hair bit weirder. I mean, I don't believe that they're just dumb apes. Do I believe they are a natural evolutionary branch of our same tree? Absolutely. But that also does not exclude them being quote unquote uh, magical or supernatural. Although I don't believe in magic and I don't believe in the supernatural. (laughs) I believe that these are natural abilities that we have forgotten or don't use or didn't evolve. I mean, there's no telling where we would be as a civilization had we gone a different route. That's right. And the thing is, we went the material route. We went the route of tools. And so our minds are evolved around notions of things. To do a thing, you require a thing to do the thing with. But that's not necessarily true. I mean, think about how many children in this day and age cannot do simple math in their head and have to have a calculator. There will be a point in the future if people forget how to do math that they'll think that doing math in your head is some kind of magic. Yeah. You know? (laughs) If it's been so long, I mean, by the time we get complex AI, there are going to be things that we used to do in our minds that people don't do anymore, and you go 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 years in the future, and they may have forgotten that people ever did that with their minds. Oh, I'm sure of it. Yeah, I, I don't see any, I just don't believe there is a supernatural. Everything's natural. That's one of the things I have to admit when listening to, to Bigfoot stories, reading stories, listening to podcasts that just makes me want to pull my hair out sometimes is the the dualism of it all, the, 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 the fear. And I understand some uh, encounters are horribly fearful. I, I don't want to put people down or criticize people. But it's all so homocentric. It's all from our little short, narrow views of reality. Oh, this was unnatural. Oh, this isn't a natural animal. How do you know? <laughs> There's four billion years of evolution on this planet. You ain't seen it all. How do you know what's natural? You know, you're not used to this. This is unknown to you. That I'll buy. But unnatural, who knows? And here's the thing. Everything that Bigfoot does somewhere in some human mythology is attributed to human magic wielders of some kind. Priests, priestesses, witches, wizards, druids, whatever. Shamans. There's nothing they do that at some point someone in our species is not alleged to have also done. I never thought of it like that, but yeah, that's... That's ab- that's absolutely correct. I mean, that that's interesting. That's huh. Yeah. Of course it takes I guess it takes someone with my background to be able to see that because you know, stories of I mean, and the stories out of family history get, you know, people that hear them and say, well, "That's crazy." You know, like my great great grandfather who was a real well-known root doctor or is he would have called himself a witch. Um his helping spirit was allegedly a booger, you know, and when he would be in a real hard situation where someone was real sick and he didn't know if he could heal them, he'd go out and talk to them and get them to help him. Now that's the story. Now I don't, I don't know what any of that is or means I wasn't there, but that is the story that was told. And, um, my grandmother always said that these things protected us and it always protected our family. I mean, and I've, even had an experience that somewhat goes along with that when they ran those kids off that were cutting down the bamboo and camping out down there doing drugs and whatever else drinking and carrying on. Yeah. You know, I mean, and that's only, that's the most tangential surface kind of thing. I wasn't here. I didn't see it. I don't know, but that's the story. And, um, 
you know, that looks to be the same kind of thing. And then the fact that within a night or two, they're here at the back door talking and slap on the back. And it's one of the few instances of mind speak where they let me know, we're here, you're fine. Uh, that was the exact words I got. We're here, you're fine. I, I just don't see any of this as supernatural because I don't believe there is a supernatural. I believe there's superstition and then there's reality. And our superstition is that humans can't do these things too. But, you know, it benefits people in the positions of power and always has. And I'm not talking about, quote, unquote, the deep state or, you know, government conspiracy. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about from the beginning, the chief of the tribe, the priest, the, you know, whoever was at the top of the pyramid, the kings and later politicians. It's all the same thing. Whoever is benefiting from keeping everybody else dumb and powerless they're the ones promoting those stories to stay in power and to lead. You have to create need. They have to need you. That's exactly right. Need and fear. That's right. And that's the thing. When, when people tell all these stories about these monsters, these fearful beasts, my ancestors never looked at the, at the, the good folk that way. They never looked at any of them that way. Now they knew there were bad ones and they knew that if you pissed them off, You'd had it. You'd had it. <laughs> but that was your problem. You did it. That wasn't the fault of the being. You had just crossed a boundary that you should not have crossed. That's like I, I always heard the old people say, if you ever run across a booger, don't look at it the eye, in the eyes. Bow your head. Bow your head. And tell it you're sorry and walk away. I mean, and I have to admit, as a child, a lot of this provoked a lot of eye rolling in me, <laughs> you know, because even though I'm interested in this stuff and I'm listening to it, there's the other part of me that, you know, is part of modern culture and, you know, is watching, uh, you know, science shows on, on whatever the equivalent of PBS was at the time, you know, is watching regular programming just like everybody else in the country, you know, that's that's interested in science and modern culture and art and history and those kind of things is hearing these stories. And, you know, there's both fascination and eye rolling are occurring at the same time. But now I know that they were just conveying facts wrapped in their stories. You know, they were conveying their sense. Well, one thing I'll tell you real quick too, if you've got just a second, this summer, what went on all summer is in one of my uh, garden fields up on top of the hill just to the west of it, which is also in the area of that spring. It's just above the spring. All summer, every time I went in that field, something would break a branch off and throw it down in the woods. The first time it happened, it kind of freaked me out. And I would tell them, don't you worry. I want y'all here. I'm fine with you being here. I'm not going to come down there and look at you. I've got to get work done in this field. I'm not leaving this field until I get that work done. And then nothing else would happen that evening. Uh, but I, it didn't happen every evening, but it was happening once a week or so that when I would go into that field, something would, uh, there would be a tree break back in there. You could hear it. I mean, you could hear it being broken and twisted off and then thrown on the ground. And what the sense I got, I don't know this for a fact, but the sense I got was that there, because this was in the summer. You know, they're, they're, they're almost never around in the summer. But they, this was, there was something here all summer. Um, I think there was a female down there with a baby. Hmm. That was what I would get. That was the image I would get in my mind. Because we had a real late spring here. We didn't warm up until almost June because we're at a higher elevation. And so we stayed really cold and had a real late spring. And so I think for whatever reason, this female had chosen my bamboo grows above that spring. You know, she had a great supply of deer. She had a great supply of plant matter, a lot of cover. And then whatever the energy of those springs are was available to her too. And that's, that's what I think was going on, but it went on all summer. And um, it wasn't that long ago that I was out in my dad's yard, which is up, at, up on the top of the hill too, and um, heard a break down in the woods. And then yesterday I was out working in the yard doing some work, and there was a big crash down in the woods to the south of me. Um, and that, that's unusual to have anything going on in summer or winter. So anyhow, it continues, and, and uh, 
to this day, I still can't tell you exactly what any of it was. Oh, and as to Dogman, I've never had anything that I know of as Dogman, but I did have a dream in the in 94, after I'd moved back, about Dogman, where there were two, what I call at the time, werewolves, because I'd never heard of Dogman at the time, two werewolves down in that spring uh, to the southeast of me and I'm up on top of the hill and it's at night and I'm one of them. I'm their child and I'm running to get away from a human with a gun. And the way I'm running is I'm going in like leaps and bounds on all fours and I'm grabbing the grass with my hands and pulling myself forward fast. And at the time I knew nothing of dog man. I didn't know a lot of Bigfoot encounters. I hadn't, you know, I wasn't online yet. And I remember how that just mystified me that grabbing the grass to run. Yeah. And then later I've heard reports of people reporting Bigfoot and maybe dog men too, where they saw them on all fours and they were grabbing the grass as they went forward. Yeah. And that kind of tripped me out a little. But that's the only only dog man thing that there's ever been. But um, when the only other one was when I lived in uh, Florida, um, I had gone, uh, I had left for a week. And when I came back, someone said, well, I stopped by to see you, but there was that big black dog out in your uh, courtyard and it wouldn't let me in. So I left. <laughs> <laughs> and again, you know, we know those as a puka. And they would say, you know, that the pukas were guardians. One of the other stories they always told was that the uh, uh, the boogers and the pukas were the guards of the high fairies, that they guarded the entrances to the high fae, the twati, huh. which are the equivalent to the tall whites in UFO lore, I think. And, you know, there are things that are like reptilians in fairy, fairy lore, too, things like kobolds and stuff like that. So all the stuff that people see as quote unquote aliens, that's all, you know, Included accounted for in fairy. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, in the fairy lore. And now that doesn't mean that they these things all do interact. That doesn't mean these things are guardians, but that that's what it all looked like to the, to my ancestors and you know, it kind of looks that way to me too, but I I just don't have the the data that I could put together and say, yeah, I've proven that to my satisfaction. I don't know. But that's that's the only dogman thing. Although I do know of a couple of stories of people having seen things that were like dogmen, you know, and, and not right in the, not right here on the farm, but within this area. So you know, it's uh, the whole ball of wax, and that's one of the things I hate when I start trying to tell people about all this is you know I've had it all, and so that sounds like total BS. But it seems to me that those of us who can see it tend to see all of it. Yeah, that's. The that's the problem. Uh, one of the things that I struggled with very early on, uh, and I still don't talk about very often, uh, the first time I had a Bigfoot sighting. See, I don't even like saying that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I don't either. I, I yeah. had a sighting that everybody has heard, uh, me looking through the night vision. But then I had another sighting like 30 minutes later of a completely different one in the same general area. So there's two sightings back to back, but then, you know, you can, I can go on for, you know, the next decade uh, that I spent going out into the woods looking for them. But then I grew up in a haunted house. I've seen a UFO. I've seen an orb. I, I mean, the list goes on and on. And the more people that I've interviewed and talked to, I see this time and time again, that it, Typically, if you've experienced one thing, you've experienced multiple things. Absolutely. Well, that's like I don't have any conscious memory of like abduction phenomena. Um, but I have had two instances as, as an adult where I was really, really sick with respiratory and it would not go away. And in both instances, they were different dreams, but the same thing happened in both dreams. And that was at one point in the dream, a gray alien, classic gray alien, appears in front of me. It's like sitting right in my face. And with its little four-fingered hand, it's holding a wand, and it tapped me on the chest. And both times I woke up coughing and coughed up a bunch of green stuff and got well within three or four days. Wow. So how do you factor that in? Because I know it was a dream. Yeah. It, did it pull some... I mean, how do you do doctoring on the and that's another thing in the fairy lore the fairies would heal people the fairies would come and heal people that's that's a thing that i've heard in the family that oh well the the good folk came and got him and fixed him 
you know. And like I said, when things got really bad to where they, you know, to where their medicine wouldn't fix something, often they would turn to their helpers, the guides, the fair folk, you know, whatever, and petition them for help. Um, and I've experienced that, um, but I don't know what that was. Um, I, and I, like I said, I have no memories of abduction as a as an adult. I have vague, foggy memories of being with things that look like gray aliens as a child, but I don't know what that means. And the weird thing with that is I was scared of everything as a child, but in the dream, I'm in those dreams, whatever they are, um, I was with a group of children that I knew, a group of children from the area, including my brother, and um, they're all freaking out and screaming and losing their minds and having nervous breakdowns, but I'm talking with the gray beings whatever that means. And um, that is another thing in the old lore is that the people of power, the people who had the healing abilities and the psychic abilities and whatever those are, I hate all those words, um, worked with them and would interact with them and that they would teach them things. And, but you know, those memories are foggy and they're probably just dreams. I mean, I don't, I don't know what they are. Um, although I have had things um, uh, on my arm and on my leg that would appear when I would wake up and be like cut marks or like little hard things under the skin that weren't there the night before. And then maybe like a year or two or three later would vanish at night. Huh. So, you, you know, something's going on there. But yeah, it's all, it's all super weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Super weird. And, I hate the fact that, that when you have one of these, you have all of them because that just makes it all sound so uh, so made up and so improbable and so you know easy to eye roll and dismiss. But I almost think that the phenomena itself does not want to be revealed. Yeah, and I would just say to the people rolling their eyes whenever people talk about this sort of stuff because of, you know, how unbelievable a lot of it can sound to pause for a second and just think about the person going through it and how they're trying to rationalize and understand everything that they're experiencing. Absolutely. And I would say too, that the phenomena reveals itself to individuals. It does not want to do a, um, it's not going on a press tour, you know? Yeah. It does. It's not, it's not looking for clicks and likes on Facebook. It's not, you know, it's not trying to get attention. It reveals itself to individuals. And I, I do think that most encounters with any part of the phenomena is an invitation. You know, sometimes it's an invitation to face fear. Sometimes it's an invitation to get the hell out. But it's always, um, it, I, I think it's almost never by accident. This has been an absolutely fascinating conversation for me. I mean, wow, man. Uh, thank you so much for reaching out and uh, sharing your thoughts and experiences. It's been awesome. I, I, I've truly enjoyed it. Thank you so much. If you've had an encounter with something you can't explain, Bigfoot, aliens, ghosts, or otherwise, email me at bigfootcrossroads at gmail.com. If you get a chance, check out the website bigfootcrossroads.com. You can find links to past episodes, links to the social media, merchandise, everything you need, all in one place. And until next time, remember, there's something in the woods. Yeah.